Hello, everybody. Welcome to our special Wednesday presentation. And you all know what Wednesday is, of course, right? It's called Hump Day. Now, if anybody doesn't know what Hump Day means, uh, I, I guess I can tell you. Because it's the middle of the week. So it's the hump. We're over the hump after today. So here we go. Um, <clears throat> okay, so furniture. History, style, and design. It's a rather uh, ambitious topic and subject, and even a description. <clears throat> I need to give you a little bit of background on who I am, what I am, how I got to be here, and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And in part, so anybody who's pursuing this in the fall session, in the 10-week series, which is two hours per session, will have an understanding better, perhaps, of, as to the provenance of, of what this is all about. Professionally, I'm an, an interior designer, 50 plus years of experience, architecturally trained, uh, range of work projects and assignments from cruise ship design to Marriott hotels to airport design to um, retail showrooms, uh, car dealerships, full range, full gamut. Um, the only thing I did not do was medical facilities. And um, a lot of it, my early years, early years was devoted to high-end residential projects from ground up, new builds, or from you know, renovations, expansions, what have you. So um, my experience in terms of furniture came from those years spent in the, the, the uh, high-end furniture industry. I'm originally from Toronto, grew up there. Uh, it was my early years of my practice. I worked for a company in Toronto called Ridpass Fine Furniture, which is sadly no longer in existence. But it was a very fine, fine, fine store, which when it was originally um, opened in the 1800s, all the craft shops were part of the company. Everything was made internally from upholstered goods to, to uh, drapery, window covers, what have you. So uh, a lot of my experience uh, has come from the ranges across working with clients who had the kinds of budgets that you need to have in order to acquire uh, good quality reproduction traditional style furniture. So what we're going to do today, uh, I had to make a decision as to how we're going to present this in actually less than two hours. So by the time you take into account break time, question and answer period, et cetera, et cetera, out of the two hours, we're really only going to have maybe an hour and a half me bending your ears with talking demonstrations, what have you. When I finished my last teaching assignment about five years ago, um, I had spent five years in the, the development of a number of courses I taught to interior design students, one of which was furniture. And um, in that particular teaching environment, they did not have any textbooks. So I virtually had to create my own for my students. <clears throat> so a lot of the work I did in those five years um, is what I've used to synthesize into what I then decided to produce as a, as a new educational textbook for designers, architects, what have you. And that is still a work in progress, but you're going to see a part of it today. And it's a long, long drawn out process involving a lot of research, a lot of time, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that distinguished it, distinguished that particular uh, initiative from most other books that were on the market when it started this four or five years ago was both the use of very visual timelines so I could demonstrate to the the students, exactly what was going on in France and England and Spain at the same time in terms of the development of styles, etc. cetera. Uh, photographic examples of the, those various styles, maybe Louis XIII or Jacobean or Victorian, and then associated in photographs by using QR codes, which four years ago, nobody really knew what they were. And that's a lie. They did, but they didn't know it as they do now because of the pandemic, and particularly in, in Quebec, where we started using QR codes for all our uh, vaccination proof, et cetera, et cetera. And so QR codes have become a much more uh, central part of the dissemination of information and connection. So in the, in the course of the development of this book, as you will see when I demonstrate the photographs, and you'll see it only in a few instances here, so it doesn't clutter up the pages, but each photograph will have a QR code associated with it off to the side. So that a student or a homeowner 
or consumer. Everybody has smartphones these days, pretty much. And so you can just do a scan of the QR code and it'll take you directly in a link to perhaps the Museum of Modern Art or the Met or this or that, uh, wherein there is an exhibit of the particular piece of furniture or perhaps a source where you can go and get more information about that particular uh, piece of furniture. So that's one of the key things that, that distinguishes and will distinguish this book from most other ones that I am aware of that are on the market. So with all that in mind, I'm going to start now and we're going to start. I broke this into three segments for today. I had to make a decision. There's no way I could cover six centuries of furniture design in less than two hours. So we're going to start 5,000 years ago with the settlement in the northern part of off the coast of uh, Scotland, the Orkney Islands, called Skara Bray. We're going to take a quick look at that just to give you a sense of an idea, to give you some form of perspective as to where did we come from, if you will. And in parallel, of course, things are going on in places like Turkey and uh, Iran and Middle East, uh, you know, other communities, Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to just concentrate on Skara Bray for this part of the, this lecture today. And there is a, a, a interesting five-minute video, YouTube video, which, which we will trigger and watch that also. Then we're going to jump directly to the 16th, 17th century, the era of Jacobean times, which is really when furniture really began to mature into form that was became much more recognizable. And we're going to study some of the aspects of Jacobean furniture, the, the period of the reigning monarchs at the time. I've chosen to do our focus in parallel between France and England, predominantly England, because so much of the, the furniture that we are familiar with in North America is more British influenced. A um, little less so is French influence, but um, what you have contained in most of the, the muse museums in North America is of the British yoke, which then became the American style and stylization of furniture in the 1800s and so on. And then we're going to jump to the Bauhaus, which is the seminal period in the evolution of furniture and design, which was from 1919 to 1933. And there is a Montreal connection to the Bauhaus, which we will explore and examine also. So I'm sort of hop skipping across the time span to give you a perspective as to how things change and maybe to some degree why they change. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into the, um, uh, the presentation, which is a 76-page PDF file, which I constructed for today. Now, at the end of this course, and Howard already has it in hand, he will email it to you all this PDF file. So you'll have it as a, as a bonus for yourselves, uh, as a reference point to look back on. And uh, we're going to follow through basically page by page so you have a way to uh, get a good comprehensive idea as to how I progressed through that time span. And for when you receive it yourself, you can also then go back and review it in the same manner. So just give me a moment here while I just switch off to where I need to get to, to get to another screen here. Because I work in a predominantly a Mac environment, there are certain features of Mac that allow me to do things that you can't do in other venues. And there are times I have to be honest with you where there are difficulties with Zoom and being able to share sound, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if that occurs, uh, I just have to find the toggle. So just bear with me if we have, uh, sort of skim my knees and touch and, and getting to that point. So now I'm going to go to share screen. And this is what we want. And this is what we should have here. Now, I can't tell because I can't see what you're seeing, but hopefully you're seeing this this has the first page says furniture. Is that what's showing up, Howard? Yeah, that's it. You're okay. good. Okay. So I'm going to use the, <clears throat> this is the PDF file. I have the actual working file off to the side on another screen here, which I can pull in as I need to. But the reason I'm using the PDF file is it allows me to zoom in as I need to and zoom back out again. So it gives me more intimate controls as to what we want to look at. So this is the, cover page I designed for the book. It's the name of the course. That's my name, the credentials, copyright notice, et cetera, et cetera. As we go down, and this is 
what you're going to see here now, there's a part of the book. I've extracted things from the book, okay, so I can explain them to you. The first thing I want to focus on is timelines. So I created this timeline. As you'll see, it's parallel, England and France. And you'll see the same time spans, one above the other. France is 1600 to 1650, the reign of Louis XIII. And 1600 to 1650 in England, which is James I, Charles I, etc. I'm not going to dwell on these things uh, in an individual fashion. What I want to be able to show you and demonstrate to you is the, the, the length and the, the degree to which the research has been done, which will be part of the book and which will be much more uh, connected as a part of the course come fall. So if you look at this, you can see, and I'll zoom in some more here. James I, the reign of James I is noted, Charles I, Cromwellian period, Charles II, James II, William and Mary, William III, et cetera, et cetera. And the periods underneath here, and which are sort of the generally considered reference nomenclature for those, those periods. So this image isn't very clear right here, but we'll get to a clear one in a moment. This is Jacobean style furniture. As we move off to here, you'll see how the other furniture styles have evolved. The Queen Anne, which is defined by the Queen Anne Cabriole League, uh, Chippendale, Heppel White, Sheraton, Robert Adam, et cetera, et cetera, up into the Regency period. I chose to end today basically at up to the Georgian period if we get to cover it. But I need to make a bit of a judgment call as we go through this, not being able to sort of predict how much time it's going to take. Uh, both I and Howard will be watching the clock very carefully to see how we're doing in terms of time. So if I have, if I seem to be jumping around a lot, please bear with me. I just don't know how much ground that we can cover in a short period of time. So here I'll give you an example of the QR codes. <clears throat> this is a select example. So this QR code here might refer to this chair to the left or the one above it. Okay, it doesn't really matter right now, but you'll see how they're used, how they're employed basically as they relate to the target um, images. And then we go back down here, <clears throat> and this one is in particular is the specific target one. We're in at the very bottom here. You'll see there's a QR code. There's a picture of a, a chair here, a red chair, and the text says a QR code is shown adjacent to the red Robert Adams side chair. When scanned into your smartphone, the following page will appear. So you would immediately be taken to this page, which is the page of the Metropolitan Museum. And then the, the viewer, the student, the participant, then can look at all different aspects of, of what they have in their domain in terms of what they have in their exhibit. Across the bottom here is cut off a little bit. There's various photographs of that same chair in various angles. They're not hot linked right now, but I'm just explaining to you what it is. So essentially, this provides really vital and vibrant and up to the minute kind of information is up to the minute as it is available from the Metropolitan Museum in this particular instance. And so would be the case in, in all the QR code uh, reference um, symbolisms. Okay, so let me just say it here. And you'll see here, there are basically other examples of Jacobean furniture. Okay, again with the QR codes. You'll see there's a very distinctive style of Jacobean furniture, the twist leg. Um, one thing you need to know about Jacobean furniture, and a part of my thesis in all this is, is one part of the two is that simply this, is that the evolution of furniture style and design is directly linked to the state of technology at the time or the era in which it was done. At that period in time, the use of the lathe was not commonplace, but it was used. In fact, um, Leonardo da Vinci uh, had one of the first lathes in the 1500s, which you'll see an image of it as we go on here. But when you take a, a, a block of wood, a long piece of wood, say four inches by four inches or three inches by three inches by whatever length, and you turn it, it's called a turning, okay? And you use the, 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 the scribe or whatever, then you can turn that block, square block into a round cylinder, okay? So all furniture of the Jacobean era was straight line furniture that was tooled by using a lathe to result in the kind of pattern and shaping that you see. And beyond that, wood was carved. 
Okay, there is nothing, no mechanisms invented as yet to be able to do bending of materials, bending of woods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's a distinctive feature of of the Jacobean period. The next page, and this, as I say, will show up in your in your PDF file when you get to it. So that's just an explanation. You can read it, an example of a QR code. I'm not going to dwell on that now because you will be getting this. Okay. Again, you'll see here another extract of the timeline, just showing how it goes from the beginning to the end. And then basically a description of some of the research. It goes back as far as 30,000 years ago, uh, but focusing, as I said before, on Scarabraid in Scotland. Okay, so <laughs> jumping down here now, <clears throat> you're now at page, uh, um, I think we're at page 10. So again, I'm not going to take the time to read this to you. There's no point in my reading it to you. You will have this on your own to read, but I will give you an overview and description and of course, any questions you have, please make a note of them, and we we can review them when when it comes to question time. So basically, here we, uh, the first thing you'll notice here is reference to Katal Hayuk in Turkey, back to between 6,500 BC. Uh, reference to a, a, a chair and a seat. It jumps to the same similar reference to Scarabray in Orkney Islands in Scotland. This image to the right here is what the dwellings in Scarabray looked like. Now, you're going to see in the video, so I'm not going to describe it to you now, how this was actually discovered um, not that long ago, truthfully. This gives you a map overview. You see that uh, Edinburgh is down here, uh, right there, Glasgow. So northern Scotland, okay, up here. The Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland. A couple of close-ups, and you'll see here in the Orkney Islands, Scarabray is off on this little island here to the very... Uh, west side of it, facing the, the onslaught of the of the North Atlantic winds and, and storms. And I say that for a reason. <clears throat> this is a map. When Scarabray was discovered, and it was discovered only in the early 1900s, and uncovered and began the restoration process, which is today a very, very vital part of uh, Scottish tourism. It's a fascinating thing if you ever if you ever have a chance to visit it. Take the time to go and spend a day at Scarabray. This was how it was originally constructed. You have eight habitats here, numbers, you see, one through eight. And they were linked underground. Okay. Now, each one of these is a house, not in the shape and form of what we consider today to be a house. It's very organic in, in shape. But these are houses. And there's a couple of very predominant features of these houses. The first thing that one saw when you walked in from the the, the uh, subterranean passageway through the front door is a big stone, um, what you would call a cabinet, which looked like this here. Okay, That was the, the principal sort of prestigious thing that the residents had to display in their homes. So here it basically says eight houses joined together like a rabbit warren, low and covered passageways between the houses would have offered protection against the harsh weather of the area. Even today, as you walk along the pathways, they're told to hold on to your children because the winds are extremely strong. It's easy to be blown off the path. This is the video. <clears throat> <clears throat> now, I've tested this. It should work fine. I'm going to click on it. There's going to be a couple minutes, unfortunately. I couldn't edit the video. It's very, very difficult to edit a YouTube video. I wanted to take out the first little bit, which is an ad. I apologize for it, but this is the best I could do for this at this point in time comes from the Orkney Islands and the Neolithic settlement of Skara Bray, located in the Bay of Scale. For many years, the bay was a pristine but unremarkable inlet on a Scottish island. However, in the winter of 1850, a severe storm hit Britain, killing 200 people, and in the Bay of Scale, it tore into a grassy knoll. The next day, locals found that the earth had been stripped back, revealing a village below, albeit without roofs. Soon stories spread of treasure buried within. And in 1913, the site was excavated by an unknown party with shovels. Who knows what they took away, but they almost certainly didn't find treasure.
In 1924, another severe storm caused damage to the exposed village, and it was decided that it should be properly shored up and investigated. Enter Professor Veer Gordon Child, then of the University of Edinburgh, pictured here with his teddy. In 1927, Child visited the site for the first time, and soon excavations were underway. Despite occasionally unpleasant weather, these excavations were thorough, and resulted in the first proper plan of the village which would become known as Scarra Bray. This excavation was followed up by more work in the 1970s, with the site gaining the attention of the national press. Indeed, around this time, it even received a royal visit from the Queen and Prince Philip. All told, archaeologists had gleaned that this site had been used by people who employed grooved ware pottery. This type of pot came into Scotland with the Neolithic, and arrived just before Scarabray's inception, around 3000 BC. But more than this, investigations had soon revealed the remarkable architecture of Scarabray, effectively dry stone walling sunk into pre-existing midden mounds. And moreover, this carefully constructed village revealed that people's lives had been ordered and even comfortable to an extent not previously suspected. For example, each of the seven dwellings has a large bed on the right-hand side of the entrance, and a smaller bed on the left-hand side. It was noted that this ordered comfort was possibly reflected in the local area by a tradition whereby up until the beginning of the 20th century the husband gained a larger bed than his wife. This observation was further borne out with the discovery of beads and also paint pots in many of the smaller beds on the left hand side of the entrance. It was thought that these paint pots containing red ochre were associated with the house and also ceremonies of birth and death. Other objects were discovered in other parts of these dwellings, including finely made Neolithic jewellery, elegantly carved ivory needles, and also curious stone balls of an unknown purpose but a fascinating texture. Similarly crafted ivory needles, along with carved stone balls, have also been uncovered in another part of the British Isles, namely County Meath in the Republic of Ireland and the Boyne Valley region around New Grange. As the old saying goes, home is where the hearth is, and it was certainly the case at Scarra Bray. The fire was in the centre of each dwelling, and undoubtedly played a central part in social life. It was Veer Gordon Child's belief that peat readily available in the area had fuelled these fires. However, analysis shows that peat did not form in the area until after Scarra Bray was abandoned. Therefore, the fires were probably fuelled by driftwood, animal dung and seaweed. Fascinatingly, the dwellings contain a number of stone-built pieces of furniture, including storage cupboards, boxes, seats and shelves. This reveals an organised and ordered way of life within these dwellings, and some of the boxes appear to have been sealed watertight using clay. This innovation could have been used for washing, or even for storing live limpets within the house, ready to eat, along with the other foods that these Neolithic people were farming and gathering. What were probably very modern conveniences are, however, outdone at Scarabray by a network which traverses the entire site. I speak of a series of drainage channels which connect the homes and also encourage water to leave the site in a convenient place. This in turn allowed each dwelling to have a primitive flushing toilet. Such luxuries are usually afforded in the minds of many to those famous bathroom engineers, the Romans. So, far from basic and remote, Scarra Bray was a modern engineering marvel. And until the climate changed, for a little over 500 years, people lived ordered and sophisticated lives within its walls. If you're lucky enough to be invited in, you'd be instantly aware of the tidy, organised and socially significant order of each house as you gathered around the fire. However, around 2500 BC, Probably during a terrible storm, the village succumbed to the elements and was buried by sand, wind and sea. 4,000 years later, those very same elements would reveal the village once more and ultimately reveal the story of how people in the Neolithic made a good life for themselves on the rugged and windswept shores of the Orkney Islands. All good? Okay, okay. So... The one thing you may have noticed there, it wasn't stated. It is stated, of course, in written documentation. But the one thing you may have noticed, there was no wood. Why was there no wood? There was no trees. Everything was made from stone. That in itself is revealing. 
they were clever, innovative, ingenious. You see here in front of you the, the still from the video, the, the storage cupboard, if you will. It's all stone. And the only thing that was that was non-stone was the roofing, which was somehow or other was, was done with uh, some system of using earth and grass and what have you to create the, the, the sort of the, the igloo effect, if you will. So that's Scar Bray. And you'll see here are some images. These are all fairly recent photographs. This shows the footprint, so to speak, of some of the walls of the, of the area. You see the scale of it because you see down here, up here on the upper right is a fairly large uh, modern day or more modern day uh, barn type structure. And you see the remains of the walls here. You see the storage system here. You see the interior. Of, this is one typical house or home, if you will. And it's quite a fascinating example of life 5,000 years ago. And so in a way, Furniture of, its, of, a, of a nature of a kind was born here. And it, it's rather compelling, I find. Okay, so now, as you'll see here, there are certain pages which are called work study, and these are designed really for the student as assignments at the end of each chapter to be able to go back and review and test with their, their knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, <clears throat> chapter two. We, we move into tools. How were tools used? Well, early man used stone, flints, rocks, initially on their own, eventually lashed to handles such as a hammer or an ax. There's definitions here, which again, I won't go into time and trouble of reading to you because you'll be able to read them on your own. Some examples of some of the early tools used by man. You know, the, 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 just carved bone, et cetera, et cetera. The one on the left, the image on the left is very, very, uh, more more prehistoric. <clears throat> the one on the right is more kind of early early Middle Ages, if you will. And then we move into the harnessing and the and the uh, familiar of the the mechanized tool that was used for shaping. So Leonardo da Vinci's lathe in around year fifteen hundred. It was crank turned. So you see the handle here, like the old Model T Ford. You started the car by turning the crank. But other ones were, were driven by foot pedals. You'll see the one in the lower left here, that's a foot pedal mechanism there. You see that, that plank? So there's others that were used just by using ropes or leather or twine wrapped around the spindle and two people would pull it back and forth so it would rotate the, 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 the spindle, you know, around and around and around. Now, of course, lays were used for things other than furniture. That's how, you know, to a large degree, other than the pottery wheel, that's how bowls were shaped. So the lathe was one of the very, very early and most important uh, technological tools to help in the, in the design and production of, of, of furniture. This is a modern day lathe today, computer controlled. And there many are much, much larger than that. I'll skip through this and we'll spend a bit of time on a, a quick snapshot of some of the earlier periods of furniture at around a similar time period of time, ancient Egyptian furniture ancient Greek furniture. The middle chair is called the Klismos chair. Very distinctive. There's no other chair ever that, is, that was designed with these legs flaring out as they do, diametrically opposed to each other. One the front one shaped towards the front, the rear one shaped towards the back. Most other chairs of that period in time were straight lined like the one in the upper left here. That's a carved leg. This in the bottom left is a carved leg. This is turned, okay? and shaped by, by a lathe. We jump to medieval furniture, which starts to get us into the Jacobean period. And you'll see again, very rugged, very rough, and we'll get into more detail on this in a few minutes, very rugged and rough ways that they're used with leather as opposed to fabric to a large degree. Um, I've italicized certain points in these paragraphs here that are important for you to, to, you know, to relate back to technology into Renaissance period and more into the advanced Jacobean era. Again, you see that the, the legs are they're essentially straight line. They're shaped. All the chairs are straight lines. The backs were straight. They were carved, but they were straight. Very, very little in the way of comfort. So, and again, you'll see here at the beginning of each chapter, I've, I've chosen certain sayings by famous 
designers, design thinkers, architects. Design creates culture. Culture shapes values. Values determine the future. Uh, it's a very important commentary. We have a couple of different summaries here of the definitions of the periods of, of pardon me, of furniture periods over time. Starting, of course, the Stone Age, Egyptian, Neolithic, Greek, Byzantine, up through to Jacobean. And then in the following table on the next page, I know that there's a, a more detailed breakdown of the Jacobean era because there was four monarchs in that period of time. And on the right-hand side here, again, up through uh, Rococo, Industrial Revolution, Neoclassical, Tropical, the Aesthetic Movement, Victorian, Queen Victoria, Arts and Crafts, Art Nouveau, Asian, again, eclectic Bauhaus, all, all through transitional and contemporary. Under traditional is a very important part of evolution of furniture design. The Georgian period, um, really beginning with Chippendale. Hepplewhite was a, was a contemporary of the same time. The Adam brothers, two architects, similar similar time. Sheraton. Duncan Fife was not British. He was American. But he was one of the most notable cabinet makers in all of America. Uh, he, would, he would borrow or steal some of the stylizations that were uh, prevalent in, in, in the UK at the time and reproduce them in his workshops in Boston. And then you'll see a breakdown by the reigning monarch. I just thought that would be of interest to you. So you can see in terms of the dates, who was the monarch in those periods of times and what the period commonly known or associated with that particular monarch and, and, and time span. And then, of course, the generalization of the style. Similarly for the French periods, so the you know the the reign of the Louise was was most prominent in in, in furniture evolution and styling and design. Um, I take it only up to through to Art Deco. And this is a little challenge for you. This is a chair. I'm not going to tell you where it came from or what it was. There's three images here. If you want to be curious about, it, do some research. It's a famous chair. In fact, at one point in my life, I owned two of them. They're quite beautiful. They're quite distinctive. You'll see the carving here, which is at the knuckle over here. There's a crest that's associated with it. So a little challenge for you if you want, you want to pursue it. Work study page. We jump down to here. Another famous saying, form follows function, which is stated by Louis Sullivan, who was the architect who trained Frank Lloyd Wright in, in uh, Chicago in those years. Actually, it's been modified a bit. His actual uh, phrase was form ever follows function. But it's been commonly abbreviated so that form follows function is the principal driver of design. This is going back in the 1800s up until today. If you think about it, if you analyze those three words, it tells you everything you need to know about what creates good design. You strip everything down to the basics, the essentials, strip away anything that's extraneous. You analyze and determine the function, and then you create the form to satisfy the function. Now, Jacobean. Some other photographs here, which, which because it's, we're zoomed in closer, they're a little fuzzy, but they, they come out better when you go a little further back from them. The Jacobean period is generally recognized from 1603 to 1625. And Again, a summary of facts about the Jacobean era. Being of the reign of King James I, uh, something about the architectural style, uh, changing the way chairs were made. Okay. The backs were higher, but they're still all straight backs. They were only a few were actually angled. Um, you'll see the turnings here of the different leg types. The acorn was a, was a stylistic uh, element that was introduced at this period of time, which you'll see in many, many pieces of furniture, particularly in tables, in the legs of tables, with stylized big, big acorn. And again, to stress that, that <clears throat> wood was either turned or, um, pardon me, shaped. And in that period of time, a style evolved called linen fold, wherein you see the close up here, the actual sheets of wood were actually hand carved to create the folds of linen, fabric folded back on each other to alleviate the boredom of just 
there's no detail on walls. So this is a classic, typical elevation of a room with two doors, and then all this panning at the lower part here under the wainscoting is linen fold. The opposite wall is, doesn't have it so much, a little bit around the bookcases. And you'll see another detail here, a photograph of the linen fold down here. And that's still used today in reproduction of Jacobean pieces of furniture, that linen fold motif. So here you see the acorn, as we're referring to in this sort of refectory type table. Now you'll also notice that the, the, the horizontal pieces between the legs, they're called stretchers. Why are they there? Because they couldn't devise a way to make the legs to be stable enough to support a large scale table. So they had to construct these bridging elements to keep them rigidly, rigidly vertical. So it kind of defeats the purpose because it's awfully hard to pull a chair into it when you've got this barrier here. But it was common at the time. It advanced to this type of a base down here, that's sort of the, the X base, where you could pull a chair into a certain degree, more so in the center. But then again, you see the carving of the wood here on the backs of this chair and the carving and the motif of the, the top of the chair back. Um, the, the stool, the carving in the, in the, it was called the apron here, and the carving here in the apron. And the twists and the carving the top here between the, the top of the, the leg and the stretchers across here, they're all carved. And all this chair is carved. So that was the driver of Jacobean style. It was limited to what can you do? with the tools that you have. And that was what they could do. Now, from here we jump to William and Mary, 1688 to 1694. And this is a very important part of the evolution of, of design and style. A couple of things happened in the period of William and Mary. The shaped leg, as you see it here, the cabriole leg, you see it right here. You'll see it in other instances that more as we move on was one of the important elements. But here again, you still see a carry over the Jacobean style, a much more delicate X space here in, in, the, in the stretcher. Okay. Again, carving here, but we have a, now we have an upholstered seat and an upholstered back. Again, pretty rigidly straight, slightly angled. This is a gate, a gate leg table where the, 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 excuse me, where the leg folds back in and the table flap comes down vertically on both sides, so you can push it back against the wall to take up less floor space. Chest on legs, a lot of brass ornamentation came into being, you see in the hardware, and it was mostly um, chiseled brass. And the, the X stretcher here, again, the fully upholstered chair here, but again, no shaping in terms of no, no, no curving, if you will. Same table shows up here in more detail here in William and Mary. This becomes more delicate. They started the exploration of different blending of different woods together. Walnut and mahogany, of course, were the prominent woods that were used at the time. Oak was also fairly easily found. And even today, oak is considered to be sort of a, a poor wood as compared to walnut. It doesn't have the elegance of the grain that the walnut has. And you see, as we progress through that same sort of era, how we then eventually moved into the first stylization of the wing chair, which really was an invention of Chippendale, which we'll come to in a minute. Bun feet, the, the uh, carved feet here, very exaggerated carved feet on this uh, exaggerated high back sofa. This is called an X stretcher here. And then we come to this point here which is Queen Anne. A famous saying by Salvador Dali, have no fear of perfection, you'll never reach it, or you'll never attain it. And here you see really the cabriole leg. Now, the cabriole leg is very interesting, and I'm going to see if I can... Actually, I'm not going to do that. After the break, I'm going to skip to another screen to show you something. It's generally considered by most people, even people who are knowledgeable of furniture, who work in the... In furniture industry, who sell furniture. The, the cabriole leg was an invention of the Queen Anne period of time. It wasn't. It was invented by the Chinese thousands of years ago. And it was discovered, and nobody really knows by whom. Could have been Marco Polo on his, on his trips to the Orient. Brought back 
to Europe. And initially was brought back to France, where French stylized uh, furniture designers employed it. They figured out a way to make the cabriolet to replicate it. This beautiful, sinuous curve. It's distinguished by a number of different things. The feet, which you'll see again a little later on, are oftentimes quite different. And one of the feet is called the clon ball, which again was an invention of the Chinese. It's meant to be the eagle's talon around an egg. We'll look at that a little later on. So it's just interesting to note that most people are under the misperception that this is a British uh, stylization advance. It wasn't. If anything, it was originally discovered by the French, who kind of then moved away from it. Britain took it on, and it became prominent for hundreds of well, hundreds, yeah, there's hundreds of years, uh, and and still today, of course, is is a centerpiece to stylized Queen Anne furniture design. So again, a summary of Queen Anne and the period of time that she ruled certain bits and pieces of information that you can that you can refer to, that same gate leg table. And then the origins of Queen Anne furniture. This is a very elaborate chest. Olive wood, oyster, veneer, and sycamore. The banded chest, beautifully done. Again, the ball feet. And other examples of Queen Anne furniture, the wing back chair, around 1760. The S curve which is sometimes used in, in speech and definition. It really is the cabrio leg. Japaning, which came from Asia, of course, came from Japan. The stylization of the cabinet design was European, was really English and even Dutch. Uh, and then the application of the Japaning, that painting technique that just made it so beautifully elegant. It's delicate, delicate scroll work painting here at the corner. The, the cap rail, the feet. And again, you see here many different examples of the cabriole leg. And you see how wonderfully delicate it is. If we had the time, I have a couple of really interesting videos which would bore you to tears. <laughs> uh, exactly how today one would actually fabricate a cabriole leg in a workshop. Maybe I'll send that to Howard and he can send out an email to you. Excuse me. And so here we jump to a series of different types of chips, chests of the period. The broken pediment here, number five, is very common uh, at the time. It's often considered to be a Chippendale design and innovation. The uh, Japanese again here. But again, you'll see in almost every case except number one, we have the Cabriole Lake. The number six is very delicate lake, very beautiful. And then a series of different types of chairs of the era. Of the era. And there's this description off to the right here. It tells you the year, basically. Um, Queen Anne, 1765. Queen Anne, walnut compass seat, side chair, which is really was a dining chair. The number three was, it says it's a Queen Anne, but really was a Chippendale. Chippendale distinguished his chair designs by having what's called a carved splat. The piece of the centerpiece of the back is called the splat. All other chairs of the time, uh, up until Chippendale, had the solid splat, as you see in the Queen Anne chair, and the one in number six here. And you'll see Sheraton uh, moved away from that, sort of Robert Adam in his style, after Chippendale introduced this whole idea of, of creating this um, open fretwork kind of styling of the splat. And then more into the Georgian period, into Chippendale. Chippendale distinguished himself in many, many different ways. One way is he produced the very, very first book called The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director by Thomas Chippendale. I actually have that book. I have a copy of that book. It's fascinating. The drawings are great, quite beautiful, quite wonderful. And he released this to the general public. He sold it from his, from his shop. So all the other competing cabinet makers in London at the time could go and buy this and attempt to make copies of the work that he had, that he had made famous. And then at the same time, or similarly, um, um, Heppelwhite did the same thing. Um, I have a photograph of the book, of the cover of his book. Thomas Chippendale was famous more so than anything else for this particular chair, the, the armchair and the side chair. You see the carved um, at the top of the splat here, the carving, which is the, the oyster shell. 
And the oyster shell down here at the, what's called the knuckle at the top of the leg, oyster shell here at the center of the, the chair, which is usually was in this zone right about here. The claw and ball foot. Claw and ball foot over here on this table. This is oftentimes was the early version of what's called the butler's tray table because the tray would separate from the table and the, the, the serving people could carry it off into the kitchen. Chip and Dale's design of the Camelback sofa. He invented this style, this design. Uh, you've got two different types of bases here. The, the more standard Chippendale square leg, which is usually had a bit of fluting on, on the, each, each edge with the stretcher across here. A single seat, which is called a mattress seat. Today, you don't often find that. You usually find three, three seat cushions. And oftentimes, you'll also be able to find the double camelback, which has got two humps instead of one. But this is the more popular one. And again, this is a more delicate, more stylized. But you see the flare of the arm, the high arms. Uh, the exaggerated flare of the back of the camelback and the loose cushions, loose seat cushions. Chip and Dill was very much influenced by, by many Asian factors, and this is uh, called the Chinese Chip and Dill armchair and the side chairs. And you still find these today in many furniture shops, fine furniture shops if you want. And you oftentimes, well, back in the 60s and 70s particularly, these would be available in anything from the natural walnut appearance here to fire engine red to gloss white, to cherry, uh, sorry, canary yellow, apple green, what have you. They were very popular because of that facility that you could, you could color key them, color coordinate them into any type of uh, design setting you want to. This is a famous Chippendale cabinet in a famous uh, home in, in Britain. I forget which one it is now, but i look it up for you. But you see the delicacy here of the inlays. Just fabulous, fabulous work and so beautifully done. Very delicate turning of the feet here. And this is a, is a recessed curvature in the cabinet. It serves no purpose, except that it's just very beautiful. I'm watching the clock here. We are at 151, so we've got a few more minutes before we're going to do a question period. So I apologize for sort of rapidly going through this, but you'll see that we're not even halfway yet. So Heppel White. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because you will have all this for yourselves to look at. But you see that the difference between the Chippendale style chairs and the Heppelwhite chairs. This is how Heppelwhite defined his product, if you will. More delicate, more feminine style, more detailed, beautiful integration of different woods. This is called a shield back, okay? which Sheraton also borrowed and it was became known as a Sheraton shield back chair. This is what's called a spade leg, it's square tapering down to the foot, as you see here. The cabinets that were associated with Heppelwhite that he designed. And then into Sheraton, the Sheraton, famous Sheraton table base. Very distinctive. He invented that table base. It was clever because it was strong enough to support the whole darn table. That's a table that normally is like five feet in diameter. So it took a lot of engineering skill to devise a system to make this you know, these, these very delicate looking legs support that whole table. A Sheraton sofa, very distinguished by the, by the cutout here of the arm as it goes up to the top of the, the upholstered arm. Other aspects of Sheraton designs. You'll see that more delicate sofa here. Just exquisitely beautiful. Robert Adam, who with his brother, uh, Robert Adam was more the furniture styling, style, stylist they were both um, both architects working in London at the same time as Chippendale and Heppelwhite. Some instances of the work that they did. So you see, they kind of borrowed one from the other, but each one uh, applied a different kind of twist, different signature to the styling. And because Chippendale was the first, and he was the first to sort of incorporate newer technologies, you know, by the time Adam and uh, Sheridan came along, there was different capabilities within the, the technologies to create these more delicate styles. You know, you've, if you've been in any fine furniture stores, you've seen these glass doors with the glass inlaid into the wood. More modern ones, replications show the wood is actually uh, applique, the surface de, de vit, just sitting against the glass. But the, the, the really fine ones, were, those are all individual pieces fitted to the shape of the, the contour of the, the wood pieces there. We're going to continue with the Bauhaus. Why the Bauhaus? 
Well, it's in a way, it's kind of the midpoint between all the traditional, transitional, old world style of furniture and what is today's design and furniture design philosophy. A couple of quotes here. Design is not just what it looks like and feels like. Design is how it works by Steve Jobs. And again, by Louis Sullivan, form follows function. The Bauhaus, 1919 to 1933. Very interesting history of the Bauhaus. That's only 14 years. Fact is, the Bauhaus actually began some years before that, not as the Bauhaus, but as a philosophy in Germany about schooling and about what schooling should be when it comes to training creative people. And the thought was, and it was part of the uh, something called expressionism, but the thought, the prevalent thought was that that schools of that nature, creative schools, should not have teachers. And if they did, they should not be called teachers. They shouldn't necessarily function as a teacher as we know it today. They were meant to be a colleague, a compatriot, a conspirator, if you will, an equal conspirator to the student. And the idea was that any good design can only evolve through art. And art is the form of expression. And so going back 30, 40, 50 years before that, the prior thinkers um, that became very large influences on what became the Bauhaus. Um, Henry Vandeveld, for example, 1863 to 1957, was one of the, 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 the precursors, pre, pre-thinkers of the Bauhaus. He and other prominent thinkers in Germany at the time who were part of um, uh, a loosely formed association called the Werkbund, W-E-R-K-B-U-N-D, which was a philosophy, again, about employing and, and um, identifying and nurturing the creative flow of, of thinking into and out to design. So that when um, when the Bauhaus was, was first developed in 1919 formally, and here you see it was the original, the original uh, mostly the original Bauhaus faculty, around 1929, uh, that became a seminal philosophy that came out of that. So, so expressions like form follows function, which is an American philosophy and an earlier time, was also adopted to the kind of thinking that went, on, went became the centerpiece to the, to the principles of design in, in the Bauhaus. Now, these are some examples. There's some random examples here worked by some of the proponents. There's a name you may be familiar with, Le Corbusier, very famous French architect, whose real name actually was, and here's a bit of a tidbit for you, was Charles Edouard Jeannet. He became known, he, call, he called himself Le Corbusier. Some of the examples of furniture done by him and by uh, Mies van der Mart Stam, Marcel Breuer, you'll notice there's some very significant common features to all these pieces of furniture. Aside from this chair here, look at what the, the, the basic form is that creates or satisfies the function. It's tubular steel, bent tubular steel. In this chair here, which grips the upholstery. In this chair here, called a Seska chair. It's a Seska armchair. It's also made with that arm. It's called the side chair. Uh, the table is wood, of course. This chair here, which I actually have one of these chairs exactly like this. These tables, it's all bent tubular steel. Cor the Corbusier designed this. This is a famous piece of his. You'll see it in, in modern furniture design collections using the Pinto hide. Eileen Gray, the famous architect, designer who created this table. The unique thing about this table, as she conceived it and designed it, is that this, the platform of the table goes up and down, slides up and down this vertical rod here. So you can raise it or lower it as you need to. The famous Vlasily chair by Marcel Breuer. And this was one of the first progenitors of that whole school of design thinking. And how did it come to be? Well, we're going to skip here a little bit and go down to something else and we'll come back to this in a second. 
You skip down to here. The first bicycles, which were designed in the 1860s. In fact, the first bicycles did not have pedals, believe it or not. They were called um, street markers. <laughs> it was exactly as you see it here without the pedals. It had a seat, had the wheels, had the handlebars. And men would get on these things, and it was like the sort of the modern-day skateboard, if you will. They would walk along, their feet on the ground. They would, they, would, they would sort of push themselves along, and then when they could, they'd just get up in the seat and ride. But they could not, it was not self-powered except by their feet. But Marcel Breuer questioned the idea that the new technology that was evolving, the bending of tubular steel, as you see here, is very sinuous, elegant forms, okay? And these were both bicycles that were created by uh, Starley and his company. It was employed in the design of the Wasson chair. Follow the curvature of the design. Skipping back to here, you'll see how that was used in so much of the design of the day. And most pieces of furniture, unless it's what you call flat bar steel, which is, this is flat bar steel here, which is shaped, okay, and curved. This is the Barcelona P Pavilion in um, 1905, I believe it was, that uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe uh, designed and was created as part of the World Ex Ex Exposition. No furniture. And if you click on this, it's a hot link. Okay. It should take you to, and you're going to see it here. Hey, are you still awake? Oh, sorry, you remember that song? It will take you to a YouTube video which we're not going to look at now because we don't have time, but you should be able to hot link it when you get the PDF file. Um, Noel Furniture is still a prominent uh, representative of manufacturer uh, of furniture globally. Their Western head office is, is, I believe, is still in New York. They have a showroom here in Montreal. And Noel was a great um, leader in the adoption and the dissemination of the great design thinkers of the Bajos. So there's a little bit of the part of their philosophy here about the old furniture and their partnerships. These are modern day thinkers today. David Adagé just won the, uh, the Pritzker Prize, I think, for architecture last year. Rem Koolhaas designed the, the new World Trade Center in New York. A list of some of the designers that evolved from the Bajos, not in any particular order. And there were other lesser known and so many great artists. Again, the bicycle. And this is the work of Marcel Breuer. Again, bent tubular steel in every instance here. That became the common feature using that technology, exploring different ways to use the form and the minimalism involved. I used to have a Wasley chair. It doesn't look comfortable. In fact, it was an extremely comfortable chair. I actually gave it away to a friend of mine. Um, classic, iconic. Usually you'll see them grouped side by side in pairs in the room. Again, the, the Corbusier. And here they moved into the production of steam bent, bent wood chairs, famously produced by a company called Thonet, T-H-O-N-E-T, -E a Parisian, a French company. But it's the same form. So the function that's been defined has driven the form to reciprocate, to uh, recite the expression of, the, of the, the purpose of the function. Harry Bretoya, who was not himself, did not actually, as far as I can see, attend the Bauhaus, but his thinking came out of the Bauhaus principles. The wire mesh chairs, very famous. Again, Eileen Gray. And she worked with Le, Le Corbusier in some of the designs of some of his, of his furniture. Look at the absolute extreme minimalism. I mean, that can't be comfortable, this day bed. It's interesting to look at, but good Lord, what are you going to do with it? Um, and this is just bizarre, truthfully. I mean, I, if I imagine myself trying to sit on that and be comfortable, well, one arm is going to be comfortable and one is not, most clearly. And this, not really sure what that is. But these are the kinds of ideas that, that flowed from, from the Bauhaus and the Bauhaus thinking. Then we go to another extreme, Gerhard Rietveld, who went off and did not do anything that was, well, I shouldn't say not anything because there's the paperclip chair down here, which is bent tubular steel. But everything else is basically straight line wood. This is a famous chair because of the way he used the colors and the simplicity of the, of the, of the forms. 
these van der Rohe, who coined the expression less is more, which isn't actually true. He, he borrowed that expression from a famous poet, um, which is in one of the famous poems, and I won't go into it right now, but uh, everybody associates that expression less is more with Mies van der Rohe. There's a very interesting association with Mies van der Rohe from a number of different points of view. Mies van der Rohe was the third director of the Bauhaus, the last director of the Bauhaus. That's a little known fact. Most people don't know that. At the end of the Bauhaus in 1933, they closed the Bauhaus because Hitler was appointed chancellor of Germany. And the principals of the school, the, the directors of the school, could see that the the, the end was, was near in terms of free thinking in, in, in that period of Germany at that time. And they closed the school. And all the principal designers and architects scattered throughout the globe. They all left Germany, basically. Most of them to the United States. Mies van der Rohe became famous. He, he resettled originally in Chicago. And a number of his classic buildings are in Chicago, New York, and in Montreal. West Mount Square is a Mies van der Rohe building. And we'll see this in a couple of minutes as we explore a little bit more about him and his contribution. The Barcelona chair, again, now this is what you call flat bar steel. It's shaped and curved. Extreme simplicity in the form. Flat bar steel in this, in this form of the chair here. Tubular steel here. Flat bar steel in the, in the design of this table. Tubular steel in the design of that chair. Now, I happen to live on, on Ile des Sœurs, and most people are not aware of this, but this is part of the heritage of Mies van der Rohe. Because not only did he design Westmount Square, and we'll go into the, the history of that in a minute, he also designed three buildings on uh, Nuns Island, two of, of which are in this very, very early photograph. If anybody knows the Ile de you'll recognize this perhaps. That was the old Champlain Bridge. Uh, this is this is on Avenue Caro. This is one of his buildings here. The other one there, the third one is way down here off, off, off picture. But he also designed a gas station. And this is the model of the gas station. And that was the photograph of the gas station at the time, the Nesso station. And it holds very, very true to his severe philosophy of again form follows function less is more okay of the absolute clean purity nothing unnecessary in a gas station and look it's transparent and you can go on online you go do google searches you'll see dozens of photographs of this i just chose two that i found were striking but a gas station are you kidding me that's astonishing that that uh, a thinker like that could <coughs> find a way to make that work in that sort of clean purity. <coughs> Excuse me. This is one of the uh, three buildings. And again, you'll see that it's just exactly the same following his principle of design. And at one point in time, the developer of the, of the property, <coughs> excuse me, was insisting that the band road designed the building so that each unit had balconies. And he threatened to walk away from the project if the, if the developer insisted on it. The consequence was they don't have balconies and they never will. And the classic Westmount Square. Now, how did Mies van der Rohe happen to come to Montreal? He was brought here by Phyllis Bronfman, Phyllis Lambert, the daughter of Charles Bronfman of the Seagram Brewing Dynasty. Phyllis Bronfman was a graduate architect at the time, married to a gentleman by the name of Lambert living in France. And her father uh, communicated with her and said he was acquiring property in New York City for the Seagram's new head office building. And he was wondering how she might be willing to be some sort of a contributor in that process. She, of course, is a great disciple of Mies van der Rohe in the Bauhaus. And she insisted that she become appointed director of planning for the project. And when she uh, proved to her father that she knew what she was talking about, that she was brought into the fold in that capacity, and she hired Mies van der Rohe. And they designed the Seagram's building. 
which is a famous, famous film. I don't include it here. Uh, I wasn't sure how much time we'd have available, but it's just anyway is interested. You can do a Google search. It will be included, of course, in the fall session of the series. Really, what you're seeing here today is just scraping the surface, literally. There'll be so much more in the 10 weeks that, that, uh, that we'll be having in the fall. But if anybody knows uh, Westmount Square, this is familiar to you. You got the low sort of pavillon here which is common to most of the buildings he designed. Many of them had that, uh, that feature, a low two-story, three-story part of the complex. And then the, the buildings are just defined by rigid, rigid adherence to simple geometry, geometry and forms. And you have to stop and think, and I don't know if any of you ever had the, the pleasure of actually being in one of the apartments in Westmount Square. I designed a penthouse in there for a client some years ago. I've had friends who lived in there. And if you look at this, the reality of, of this, and this is a little lesson in, in the geometry of building architecture in what's called curtain walls, and this is called the curtain wall. The distance between every vertical line here, which is called the mullion, is exactly five feet, center to center. Why is that? Because the distance between each column here, which is the structural ribbing that supports the building, is 25 feet on center, which divides up into five vertical mullions. In commercial office buildings, take a look at uh, Plaza Marie. It's a really good example. And most every other building in downtown Montreal or any other major city, you'll see that all those vertical ribs are typically five feet apart. Now, sometimes they split them so they're 30 inches apart, but that's just cosmetics. Structurally, they're five feet apart and every interior partition that comes, that flows outwards to meet the exterior wall has to meet the mullion at the exterior wall. It cannot come and butt into the glass. So that is the practical principle that determines and drives planning and design of structures of this nature. So in a building like Westmount Square, let's just quickly, I don't see, know what you're going to see here when we do this, but I'm going to see if I can zoom in here. The practical consequence of that is that you can't see it here, okay? But for example, these are apartments on each floor. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, that means that building is sixty feet wide, roughly. Okay, every five feet there's a mine. Okay, where's the kitchen? Well, I know because I designed a penthouse. There, the kitchen is one of those windows. In fact, it's probably three of those windows. But the windows go floor to ceiling, floor to ceiling glass with what's called a mountain across the the middle here, that lesser horizontal band above the, the floor line, okay? And, and the bathrooms, of course, are all usually in the interior. There's no bathrooms that have external light in, in this complex. They're all interior windowless. But the kitchens, of course, are on the window. So it begs the question, you know, how can you responsibly create a, a practically planned well-designed kitchen when you can't put anything on the exterior wall. Well, he did it. And it's quite an astonishing achievement in terms of, of how, uh, how he used this design for all the, the properties and all the buildings he created throughout the world, essentially. So that's the Montreal connection to Mies van der Rohe. So I'm going to stop here and ask for questions.